enter into a time of prayer together this morning, I would like to invite all those who would like to come and kneel at the altar to please come forward. But I'd also like to specifically invite any of our soon-to-be students this upcoming week, as well as those staff members, those teachers, those individuals who are day in, day out, or even weekly at a school. Um, we want to take a time just to pray for you. Uh, also, today we are handing out tags to put on backpacks for students. It's just a reminder of how much God loves them. Uh, adults, we ask, I know many of us like to take some home for either grandkids or children that cannot be here. If you would like to do that, please wait until next week to grab a tag. That way we make sure we've got some for all of our students. It's a cool position being up here seeing all these cute smiling faces. They just know school is right, coming right up. <laughs> Let's take this time to go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for worship. Thank you for a time where we get to say hallelujah. Thank you for the time where we get to use our voice to declare how good you are. Lord, I pray that for each and every one of us, our relationship with you could be based off of worship. Could be based off the time in which we get to proudly proclaim your name, where we get to sing joyfully, where we get to experience you in a whole new way. Lord, I pray that for today, as we're in this place, that we may have the heart of worship, that we may have the heart that is open to whatever word, whatever prayer, whatever song needs to be spoken into our spirit today. Lord, I pray for your spirit to move and fill us today so we may go out in this world and we may ex uh, cause change in our community. Lord, for each and every one of us, I know that we may be the only Jesus some people see. And so for that, I pray that we are more the hands and feet in which you need. Lord, you're so good. You're so good to us. You, you are so good, in fact, that, God, if you don't do anything else for us but say, give, our, give us the opportunity for salvation, you are already more than enough. That the day in which you said your son, and you sent him to die for us on the cross, that was more than enough love in which you could have ever shown, but you still continue to be a good God that gives more and loves more and blesses more than we could ever pay back. So today I pray as a congregation we may have a heart of thanksgiving. Lord, I pray for these students, these teachers, these staff members, this faculty. God, I, just, I pray that they may be the light that their school system needs. I pray that they may be like the city on the hill that everyone sees, but they may shine the light of Christ into their hallways, into their classrooms, into the lunchroom. Lord, I just pray that they may be a difference maker starting today. It doesn't matter what age, if you are in pre-K, preschool, or even a senior in high school, God, you, we know that you, we have the opportunity through you to be a difference in this world. So, Lord, I just pray for each and every one of these individuals that they may be blessed by you, but also may be a blessing in your name. For my students, as they prepare for school, I know it's nerve-wracking, I know it's scary, I know there is fear in that, but God, I pray that you may show them that you are going to walk right beside them in these moments, that in times in which they are worried of if they're going to make friends or if they have friends in their classroom, may them experience the comfort that you can give. Lord, I pray for our teachers. I know that it, right now our country does not allow you to speak the Bible in school, most schools. But God, I just, I pray that through their actions, through their tone of voice, through their smile, that they may shine the light of Jesus and the gospel into their classroom. And for even our staff members at school, whether you be a librarian, a lunch lady, a, a custodial service, even in times in which you think you are behind the scenes, Lord, I, I know for a friend of mine, his mom was a uh, lunch lady and she used to pray over the food every day before lunch that those children who would partake in this food may be blessed and encouraged and, and, and see the light of God and I know the difference that just those prayers make so God I just pray for these groups of individuals that they may fully experience you this school year 
Lord, I know that this, before our prayer, usually I mention friends and family in whom we want to pray for, and I didn't. Because, God, I, I know that we like to keep uh, some people who are in serious need of your prayer that we like to pray for on Sunday mornings. But if we were truly honest, everyone needs a ground-shaking God moment. And so, Lord, I pray for everybody at this point. I pray for healing in those who need it, whose body is weak and they need you to move. God, I pray for the ears of those to be open to hear a voice from you in which they have not heard you for a while. God, I pray for the eyes to be open for those people who have not experienced you in the full light. But Lord, this morning I also want to pray for Dr. Ellen Roberts' mother who is in the hospital currently. I pray for healing in your will if that is available, Lord, but I also pray for comfort for decisions that have to be made in the future. I pray for Charlie Smith as he continues treatment and testing. And whatever that may take, God, I just pray for his healing in the body to be completely done. But God, we know that you have a plan and a purpose. And we know that for him, if, if, if you need him to make more trips, then that is another chance for him to speak the gospel into a nurse's life who may have not heard. And so, God, I just pray for him that if healing is possible, allow that to be taken from him. But as, as, as treatments and tests continue, may he understand that you are always in the room. That even in times in which his body may experience fatigue or he may be nervous, that you are right beside him the entire way. And, Lord, I pray, pray for Kay Gorday as she has testing and uh different types of doctor's appointments coming up in the next couple of weeks, may in times in which she feels like she is alone, know that you are with her and know that, God, you are the God of a miracle worker and you are the God of all healing. And so it is by our prayers that people are healed. And so God, today we pray for healing in everyone, every body that aches and every disease in which we might be riddled with. Lord, I pray we go from this place today realizing that we cannot be the same. That the Spirit has touched us in some way to where we cannot exit these doors the same person that we walked in. And that we may be fully experiencing your love. It is in your name I pray. Amen.
Father, we worship you in this place today, and we thank you for all the blessings you've poured out on us. Lord, now as a part of our worship, we take the opportunity to give back a portion to you. We pray that you'll be lifted up by it, and that you'll bless it and use it to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Yes, yes. When I was your son, Still your love followed me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. Still I'm found, leaves the 
99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you gave yourself away Oh, the overwhelming Never-ending Reckless love of God Yeah! Shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Wall you won't kick down, fly you won't tear down, coming after me. A shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. The wall you won't kick down, fly you won't tear down, coming after me. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. You know, you're here this morning. You are here this morning in 11 o'clock worship at St. Mark. And you, maybe you didn't even know that, that God's reckless love, God's love was already pursuing you. And so your response, you thought you got up on your own this morning and decided to come and show up at St. Mark. But God's love is already pursuing you. Uh, so he's already acted first. And you're being here today, that's already your response to God. God's already at work in your life. He's at work in our life, drawing us together to worship Him. Uh, this summer, we, we've had a great time this summer with our St. Mark Summer Survivor. Uh, great crowds on the last three Wednesday nights. Next Sunday morning, uh, we'll celebrate and, and, and kind of commemorate what we've done. If you've got a gray Summer Survivor t-shirt, be sure to wear that uh, next week. If you pick one of those up these last couple of weeks, bring that and we'll celebrate Summer survivor. This morning, though, I want to look at one more Old Testament character. We've looked at uh, the lives of Joseph and of Moses and of Miriam uh, from the Old Testament, all men and women who were survivors. They were survivors because of, uh, not because of their goodness, uh, not because of the purity of their character, uh, not because they just uh, buckled down and, and worked hard. They were survivors because God decided to work in them. And because God, in his reckless love, he pursued them, and they responded to God. And because they responded to God, they learned what it meant to be survivors. And I believe we can all, we can all, there's not a person here today that can't hear from God and learn how to be a survivor. This morning, I want to look with you at Aaron. Aaron is the older brother of Moses. And Aaron, here's what I want to know, all of us, Aaron was full of excuses, and if Aaron was going to learn to survive, he had to learn to beat his best excuses and let God get rid of his best excuses. Uh, now we're you know, getting ready to go back to school, and kids, be ready, right, with your best excuses because you're not going to have your homework done or something's not going to be right. Teachers tell me, I, I'm married to a teacher, so I know all about the excuses that come home. 
talked to some teachers, looked online, best, you know, classic excuse, the dog ate my homework, all right? That probably will not work anymore. Nobody believes that. Be more creative, okay? Best excuses, uh, this is a real excuse. I was studying outside, and I left my books out, and the rain fell, and, and everything's soggy, and I can't turn it in. That's a real life, that's a real life excuse. Uh, you, you, may buy, you may try this one, uh, uh, real life excuse. My little sister was throwing up all last night and I had to stay up and help take care of her. Uh, you know, family sympathy. Teachers will have sympathy, you know, with, if it's a family trouble. Uh, you know, maybe you'll pull out the, you know, my grandma died or something, but make sure you have enough grandmas to last all throughout the school year, okay? Because that could be a problem if you pull that out early and you maybe really need to, you know, use that later on. Excuse, everybody's got an excuse, Everybody's got an excuse. Somebody says it this way, uh, that excuses are the nails that build a house of failure. The excuses are the nails that build a house of failure. Uh, John Wooden, a uh, legendary basketball coach, says this about excuses. He uh, says, you don't really need excuses because your friends don't need excuses from you. And your foes aren't going to believe them anyway. So don't waste time with excuses. Aaron Aaron had excuses. Now, Aaron, I want to tell you this, give you set up Aaron's story. Aaron already had top billing or near top billing. God loved Aaron. God had chosen Aaron to be his brother Moses, like, like top lieutenant, his helper. Because Moses, when God called Moses, when God called Moses, Moses said, I can't go speak to Pharaoh. I can't lead uh, the people of Israel out of slavery because I'm um, because, uh, see, he had excuses too. It runs in the family. It, it runs in all of our families, don't we? Moses said his excuse was he was not an eloquent speaker. I, I can't go before Pharaoh because I'll stutter, I'll stumble, I won't know what to say. God says, I'm with you, I'm on you. In fact, I've already talked to your brother Aaron. He's going to meet you in the desert. You will have the, you, you, you'll hear from me, and then you whisper it to Aaron, and Aaron will be like your press secretary, your spokesman, and he'll speak for you in the press presence of Pharaoh. And so Aaron had already seen this. Aaron had seen God's goodness. Aaron, you'd think, you'd think Aaron was already on track to be a survivor because he'd experienced so much good. He had seen so many blessings at the hand of God. You'd think he had it in. He was set for life. Not so. Not so. Exodus 32 Exodus 32, it's page 47 in the Red Pew Bible. If you don't have your own Bible with you, I tell you, I just got a message a minute ago. Friends, I've got Russian friends watching on Facebook Live this morning. 32nd chapter of Exodus, the story of Aaron. And this is where the wheels sort of fall apart for Aaron and where he has to decide, is he going to get over his excuses? Is he going to find God or is he just going to let everything fall apart right there? Moses has gone away. Moses has gone away for 40 days to hear from God. And in the panic and in the terror of being left alone, here's what happens. Here's what happens. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and they said this, Come, make us gods. Make us gods, idols, who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up from Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And so Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. And so all the people took off their earrings and they brought them to Aaron. Aaron took what they handed to him. He made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf fashioning it with a tool and then they said these are your gods Israel the gods who brought you up out of Egypt and when Aaron saw this he built an altar in front of the calf and he announced tomorrow there'll be a festival to the Lord so the next day the people rose early they sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings and afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry Let's stop there before my heart breaks anymore, and let's pray. Father, we cannot live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes to us from your mouth. Uh, open today our ears, our minds, and our hearts that we could receive and live in your living word, who is Jesus. Amen. 
Now, y'all, I'm not going to get up here on a Sunday morning. I'm not going to armchair psychologist Aaron. I'm not going to try to answer uh, what, his, uh, what his motivation was or what went wrong in his soul or in his psyche uh, that in this 40-day uh, period after this, this time of separation from his brother Moses' absence, I, I'm not going to try to explain why all of a sudden uh, Aaron woke up and he, uh, and, and he, had, he had suffered from a, I don't know, a spine ectomy. Is that a thing? I mean, it was like he woke up one day and he couldn't stand up straight. The things that he knew, the things that he had seen, the things that he believed, they had all left him. I mean, this is Aaron we're talking about. This is Aaron we're talking about. This is Aaron who had been with Moses. This is Aaron. I mean, it was Aaron that stood in the face of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. This wasn't anybody. This was Aaron. If anybody was going to survive, it'd be Aaron. This was Aaron who walked across, not who simply witnessed the Red Sea being parted, not who simply read about it in a book, but this was Aaron who himself walked across on dry land with all of the sons and all of the daughters of Israel. This was that Aaron. This was Aaron who, when he was with God's people in the first days in the wilderness, when everybody was thirsty and they thought they were going to dry out and they were turning against Moses and said, what did you, did you lead us out into the desert so that we would die? This is Aaron who saw God provide water miraculously from the rock. And this is Aaron, this is Aaron who when the people were hungry and they prayed to God, God sent this, this bread from heaven, manna. And every morning they'd wake up and more bread had floated down from heaven and the people could go out and gather up everything they needed to satisfy them, to feed themselves for that day. And when they got tired, even when the people got tired of bread and they said, if I see this bread anymore, it'll be the end of us. What about some meat? And then God sent a, a north wind and blew the quail in and they had so much quail to eat. They literally, they, check it out. They said, if we have to eat any more quail, we'll throw up. I don't want to ever see quail again. This is Aaron that saw God come through every time. This is God who saw, this is Aaron who saw more than most of us will ever see in our lives. And yet this morning, and yet this day, he wakes up and the people come to him and says, well, what about Moses? He's been gone. We haven't heard from them. And see what Aaron does. Just read the verbs. The verbs are always the cue. What does Aaron do? Aaron answered. They said, make gods. And Aaron, Aaron didn't dispute. He didn't argue. Aaron just answered. He answered and he said, bring me the gold. And so he took it and he made it into an idol and he cast it in the shape of a calf and he fashioned it with a tool and he built an altar and he announced, come and worship and bow down before your God? Your gods? He did it. Aaron did it. Aaron, the one we thought we could count on, the one we knew would be a survivor. What went wrong? What went wrong? I can't figure that out. But see what happens when something goes wrong? Hear what happens when, when Moses come back down. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Moses, God told Moses what was happening down in the camp while Moses was still 40 days up on the, up on the mountain receiving instruction, receiving everything that would shape the, uh, the people of God as a civil society and as a, as a worshiping society. Moses is writing this all down. You got Moses, he's coming down from the mountain. He's, he's got the, the Ten Commandments carved in stone, carved by the hand of God, the finger of God. And, that's all, and as he's coming down, God says, hey, something's up down there. Don't you, I don't want you to be surprised. Nobody wants to be surprised like this. Nobody wants to be surprised. God says, hey, wait, the people down there, the people you love, my people, our people, they've gone crazy. I mean, they, they've gone crazy. And I think, Moses, if you'll wait here on the mountain just a little longer, I'll kill them for us, and we'll start again. And Moses says, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I love these people. These are your people. These are our people. Let's, let's, will you forgive them? Yeah, we'll forgive. Moses comes down from the mountain, 
It's a good thing. I mean, when you see what Moses did, it's good he knew because it could have been so much worse. Here's what happened. Verse 19, when Moses approached the camp, when Moses approached, this is 32 verse 19, if your Bibles are still open. When Moses approached the camp and when Moses saw the calf and he saw the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he, took the ca- and he took the calf the people had made. Y'all, this is better than anything your mama ever did to you when you were in trouble. He took the calf the people had made, he burned it in the fire, and then he ground it into powder, and he scattered it on the water, and he made the Israelites drink the water. How about that for creative punishment? How about that for natural consequences, right? You want to worship this? Here, worship it. We'll grind it up, and you can drink it. Then you've got it with you forever. And he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And here's Aaron and here's all of us, okay? Here's Aaron and here's every excuse, every excuse that you've ever offered. Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And so I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. I mean, you would laugh at that if it wasn't so sad. I just, you know, first of all, it was all these people. That's that's what we do. That's the first and best excuse we all have, isn't it? They did it. Somebody else did it, and it was because we forgot Moses was gone. So, Moses, you did it. Two excuses. They did. You know how bad all these people are. They made me do you, Moses, you were gone so long. And he doesn't even say it directly. It's like passive aggressive. That's the best kind of excuse, isn't it? They came to me and said, well, Moses was gone so long. You should have sent a text or something. Then we wouldn't have gotten so worried. You know, quick email, smoke signal, something, let us know. And then the worst, I don't know, it just happened. I threw the gold into the fire and just, boom, out comes this calf. You wouldn't believe it. Moses says, yeah, I don't believe it. But you know what? This is all of our excuses. It's every excuse we ever offered. It's every excuse we've ever offered for anything we've ever done. It was, it was their fault. It was your fault. I don't know who. It just happened. It just happened. It just got me thinking of a story. I was five years old. Uh, oldest children, we, we, all, we try not to get in trouble, but when we get in trouble, we make up the best stories, okay? I was five years old, and, and my parents came in, and, and there's the alphabet written. I, you know, I, I like, you know, the alphabet written on the wall in red crayon in our living room, okay? Alphabet. Yep. A, B, C, D, F, G. There we go. I, I loved it. The alphabet written in red crayon on the living room wall. And my mom comes in and says, who did this? And I said, my brother. He was three. <laughs> he was three. Who did this? My brother, Larry. Larry did this. You mean to tell me he knows his alphabet? He's really precocious. I taught him. I told her, I kid you, this is not a made-up story. This is a real story. And she says, well, how is the alphabet up so high when he is so little? I moved a chair over for him. <laughs> See, that just gets even worse, because then I'm an accomplice, but I don't even realize it. <laughs> Friends, excuses. <laughs> excuses just don't help. Excuses just don't help. Let me, let me, let me, just, let me be, be personal with you for a minute. What about the excuses we give? You know, I hear people, you can come at an excuse from every angle. I, I hear people, I hear people say, well, I, I don't know how to follow the Lord because I, I don't, the, the Bible's too complicated, it's too confusing. I don't understand it, I can't obey God. And then I hear people who, who actually figure it out and they study and they say, well, I don't like that. That doesn't make sense in the 21st century. I'm not, you see that, excuses on every side. I don't understand it, and so I don't want to obey it. And then once I understand it, God, that just couldn't be right. He doesn't understand where I'm living today. I, I hear people saying, you know, I, I can't, I, I don't know if I can follow God right now because I want, maybe I want children, and uh, God's disappointed me because I don't have children. And uh, so, so that's my excuse for why I can't uh, walk in obedience. And then I hear other people say, well, I, I don't have time because I have children. <laughs> 
all right? You make up the excuse to fit wherever you are. I, I, can't, I can't do this because I want to be married, or I can't do this because you wouldn't believe my husband or my wife or how they keep me from doing what God's called me to do, all right? You see where I'm going with this. We can make excuses that suit our circumstances wherever we are. And what is it we said? That the excuses are the nails that build a house of failure. Friends, I want to tell you this morning that if, that if Aaron, that if Aaron somehow found a way out of his excuses, that there may be a chance we can too. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's about your, I don't know about my church. My church doesn't help me grow. Is that your excuse? Uh, the music's too traditional, or the music's too contemporary, or that preacher, he's too loud, or that preacher, he's too quiet. All right? Don't make an excuse. Decide today. Here's the good news. The good news is the Bible shows us, because the Bible shows Aaron doesn't disappear from the story. Aaron becomes a survivor. If Aaron was going to build a house of excuses, if Aaron was going to die right here, that would be the end of the story. We wouldn't hear about him anymore, and, and I probably wouldn't preach about Aaron. But Aaron's a survivor. You know what it takes to be a survivor? Here's what it took for Aaron to be a survivor. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control. And so they became a laughing stock to all their enemies. So Moses stood at the entrance to the camp and Moses said, Whoever is now for the Lord, come to me. Whoever is now for the Lord, come to me. An invitation. And the Bible says this, all of the Levites, that's a whole family of people, all of the Levites rallied to Moses' side. And here's what I know, Aaron's not mentioned by name. Aaron is not mentioned by name in the rest of this chapter, even though he was the ringleader of the worst sin that Israel had committed up to this point in, uh, after their exodus from Egypt. He's not mentioned by name, but I know this about Aaron. Aaron was a Levite, and the Bible says all the Levites gathered at Moses' side. And so I think, so I think that Aaron looked around and he said, this is my only chance. The window is open today. The window is open today. We sang a song earlier. The clock. Take me back. <laughs> that, that kind of has two meanings. It's like a command to the Lord. Take me, like help me remember what it was like when I, when I loved you and I served you faithfully. But, but it's also sort of a Lord, will you take me back? I mean, <laughs> I'm here. I'm offering myself. Aaron stood up with the Levites. And he repented. That's the old-fashioned word. Aaron thought again about what he had done. Aaron said, wait a minute, I feel my spine growing back again. <laughs> I think I remember this God, this God who gave me strength to speak, this God who, who brought us out, the God who gave us freedom, didn't give us freedom so that we just kind of just, just raise heck and do whatever we wanted. This God who gave us freedom so that we could be free to follow him with joyful obedience. That's the God I, I want to be on his side. I want to come back. And friends, it's because of that. It's because of that that Aaron is a survivor. It's because of that that Aaron survived his worst excuses. And it's because of that that you can survive your worst excuses too. If you'll think again. If when the Lord says, come to my side, you'll come to his side. And, and see, this is amazing for, it's amazing because it's, it's, it's for all of us, for one thing. And it's amazing for Aaron. Hear this about the rest of Aaron's story. Aaron, Aaron from this point, Aaron didn't just get forgotten about and kind of ends up, you know, in a, in a footnote in like the book of Numbers or Chronicles or something not to be remembered. Aaron, Aaron was chosen to be the first high priest of Israel. Aaron was chosen to be the first high priest, and it wasn't that Aaron just decided he wanted to be high priest. God said, this is a man, the, the New Testament Hebrews tells us this about the high priest, that the high priest had to be chosen, he had to be chosen to represent the people before God because he had to know about the weakness and the frailty 
of human life. And so he had to be able to walk tenderly with the people and truthfully before God. Who better to do that than Aaron? Who better to do that than Aaron who knew fully how quickly his spine might evaporate if he wasn't trusting in the hands and the word of God? How quickly he knew he had to find his strength in someone else, not just in his brother Moses, but in the infilling power of the Spirit of God so that he could indeed be not only a high priest, but be a survivor in his own right. I love this. Leviticus 8, I don't, I don't normally preach from Leviticus in the Old Testament, but I love this. So here, here's the story. You want to know how, how, how it took to get Aaron from, from this place of, of quivering spinelessness to, to be qualified to be the high priest at Leviticus 8. You'll have to read it yourself. It tells the whole story of the ordination service of a Hebrew priest, of an Israelite priest. And on the, on the, on the second, third day of the, of the ordination, it was a seven-day ordination service. Methodists don't take that long. Seven-day ordination service. On the third day, they'd kill the third sacrifice it was a sacrificial ram, and Aaron put his hand on it, and all of his sons who were to be priests with him put their hands on it, and they took the blood of the sacrificial ram, and Moses then took the blood and marked it on Aaron's earlobe and on his thumb, the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Methodists don't do that either. So why did they do this? The rabbis, the, the, the rabbis tell us this about why they, why they marked the priest. While they marked the priest with the blood of the sacrificial ram, while they marked him on the, on the earlobe and on the thumb and on the big toe of the right foot, has to do with obedience. It has to do with obedience because if you're going to be a survivor, if you're going to be a survivor and stay a survivor, you've got to be committed to obedience. And so you mark, they marked the, the priest's ear, his earlobe with blood, because if he was going to do anything else, the priest had to hear the word of God and obey it. That's the first step to obedience is to hear. To hear what God, to hear the truth, to see Jesus full of mercy and grace and truth. You can't obey anything that you don't hear. And to mark the thumb, the, the thumb, the rabbi said, the thumb, the right hand was the seat of decision making. Every action of the body starts with the thumb. And so not simply to hear the word, but also to obey it. In the New Testament, your letter of James, James, the brother of the Lord, James, who would have been schooled in the rabbis of the Old Testament tradition, James says, be ye not hearers of the word only, but be also doers of the word. I think James envisioned this when he wrote that line. He saw the high priest in his mind's eye, anointed with the blood of the sacrifice on his ear to hear the word, but not simply to hear it anointed on the hand to obey it in every action of his body and then the foot the right toe the big toe of the right foot because every thought every thought is the is the beginning it's the nourishing point that becomes an action you think it and then you do it and you do it once and you do it twice and you do it three times and it becomes a way of life it becomes the path of life the psalms are filled with prayers like this show me your ways O lord open your path before me See, it's not simply hearing or doing, but hearing and doing together that becomes a life of surviving, a life of obedience, a life of joy, and a life of hope. I tell you this, the seven days, seven days for Aaron in that ordination time period, seven days, because it was a new thing. What else in, what else in the Bible took seven days? Creation. If God's going to make you a survivor... He's going to have to make you a new creation. Now, chances are he's not going to wipe blood on your ear and your thumb and on your foot. And he's not going to make you lay out in front of the front door of the tabernacle for seven days. But the New Testament tells us this, that everything that's in Christ, everyone Christ Jesus has claimed, is what? A new creation. And this morning, we're going to come around the table of the Lord, and we're going to remember the cross. We're going to remember the shedding of Jesus' blood. We're going to remember that event, his death and resurrection, the events that remind us that we can be new creations. 
the events that, 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 that show the way, that illustrate the path for my survival and for your survival. Don't worry, I'm not going to put the grape juice on your ear. But when you receive this gift, why mark with blood? Why were the priests marked? Because blood was life or death. Blood was life or death. God's choice to make you a survivor is a choice of life and death. It meant the life and death of Jesus. And friends, it's a choice of eternal life or eternal death for you. I want to ask you, with Aaron, will you decide to be a survivor? You've seen some things. You've experienced some things. Some of them really good. Some of them really bad. I mean, you've got reasons. Like Aaron had, you've got reasons to have good excuses. But like Aaron, will you set them aside? Will you set them aside and let God make you what God wants to make you? Will you receive the gift of his body broken for you? Will you receive the gift of his blood poured out for you? Will you allow him in this moment and over the next hour and over the next days? Will you allow him to make you a new creation? Will you allow him to make you a survivor? Because his way... His way is the only way. Jesus said it, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is no way to the Father except through me. Come to the table. Come to the table and find, and find in your life the first step or the next step to being a survivor. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the invitation to come. We thank you that you have heard all of our stories. You understand all of our excuses. And yet with Aaron, you invite us to set them aside so that we can be with you and we can be for you. So that we can receive what you want to be for us. Help us to be survivors in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus gathered his disciples around him, on the night that he was betrayed to his death, on that night Jesus took bread, he gave thanks over the bread, he broke it and he offered it to all of those who followed him, saying, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. As often as you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks over the cup, and he offered it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty Father, pour out your spirit on us gathered here out of love for you. Pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we in receiving them might be made more perfectly his body, set apart by this the gift of his precious blood. Father, make us one with Christ and one with each other as we serve in this world that Jesus loves and came to save. Father, we offer these prayers in union with all the prayers of all the saints throughout the ages, even those who are gathered now in celebration around the victory banquet in heaven. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ and by his spirit. Amen. Will you stand with me and join hands with those around you and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
You may be seated. I'd like to invite those who are assisting in serving to come and join me and Andy around the table. And uh, after we serve them, the ushers will direct you, come, come and receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you need a gluten-free communion alternative, come through the center lines and the servers there uh, will be able to help you in that way.
makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all Amen. A couple of more reasons to shout next Sunday. Next Sunday, August 12th, there'll be uh, kickoff events for youth, uh, Lake Day uh, right after church, and then uh, events for children here on, uh, on campus. That's next Sunday, August the 12th. Sunday after that, two weeks from today, I'll be hosting the next session of St. Mark 101, our new member orientation time. Uh, if you've been attending St. Mark for a while and want to know a little bit more about what it means to follow Jesus Christ or what it means to follow Christ here at St. Mark, I'd invite you to uh, get a hold of me this next week, make a reservation, come and join us after the 11 o'clock service that's Sunday two weeks uh, August the 19th go in hope and in peace knowing that Christ has given you of his spirit he is working in you so that you can be a survivor go in hope and go in joy amen <laughs>